Okay, let's start with a, a code tracing exercise. So let's work out the output of this piece of code. There's not much to it. Maybe this takes us back a bit. We, you know, we've come so far ever since three weeks ago when we first learned about functions. So uh, we'll start in main. I've drawn myself a little area to write my output. So here we'll make up a scoping box for main. All right, great. And we'll notice that this is one of those cruel questions, maybe the kind that you just got finished doing on the midterm, where all of the variables in the program have the same names. And we know that that's not a big deal because of the way that scope works. And the point that I want to prove eventually is about scope and how scope can really help us uh, to keep our data separate and to keep problems in one part of the program from being affected by other parts of the program. So I create my variables x and y, I give them the values 6 and 10, and then I print out a line of output. My first line of output is main 1, x equals, and of course I go looking and there's the value of x, it's 6, and y equals 10. Great and then I call a function. So I have to set up a box for my function f. I'm about to do line number 23. I set up a box for f. I notice that f takes two parameters. Their names are x and y, and they are both ints. And actually, before I, I started up that box, I should have made sure that I draw in that the thing I am passing into f here is 6, and the second argument I'm passing in is 10, the values of the expressions x and y in main. Okay, so I pass in uh, as the value of x, the, uh, the value 6, and as the value of y, I pass in the value 10. And then I end up on line number 14, where I begin executing the code for f. And so the point that I wanted to prove with this example, we've actually already gotten there. Ultimately, the question is, what gets printed on line number 24? But the point that I wanted to prove, which will eventually be proven on line 24, is that when we call a function in C, we use what's called pass by value. Pass by value. And the word pass refers to the idea of passing parameters, of passing arguments to the function. And the convention used in C, always used in C, is called pass by value. If we hand something to a function, what we give it is just a number. We just give it a photocopy of one of the values we have on hand. The function doesn't get my variable x. Maybe the function has something it calls x, but all I hand over to the function is a piece of paper with the number 6 written on it. The function has no idea where I got that from. It doesn't know whether it comes from one of my variables, whether I got it from some other function, whether I computed it as the result of some expression. It has no idea. All I hand over to f is a piece of paper with the number 6 written on it. And then f puts it in a variable called x. Okay, sure. It could put it anywhere it wants, but ultimately f has no idea where that number came from. Okay, so that's one of the, that's the biggest point I think I want to prove about this, but there's a secondary point, just reminding us of our roots, something that we had to agonize over during the midterm. So let's execute f. Line 14, x equals 10,000. So I'm sitting inside this scope here, the scope of, of f, and so I set the variable x to equal 10,000. And that's great, f has something called x and we set it to 10,000. We then set the variable y to negative 10,000. Great. So f has two possessions, x and y, and it can set them to whatever it wants. Those are the only things available to f. They're the only things inside of its scope. Are there other things in the program called x? Well, yeah, I guess. Main has something. Can f ever see it? And the answer is no. F has no ability to break into the scope of main and begin manipulating main's private possessions. That is one of the best benefits of scope. Because that means if I discover later that a variable is malfunctioning, that the value of x in main isn't what I expected it to be, then I know that the problem must have occurred in main. Other functions, other scopes, don't have the general ability to break in to a scope and use its values. So we, we've been saying as of this point in the course that really the reason for that is that uh, each function's uh, or each scope's variables are their private possessions. And that it's okay for you to have something called x and me to have something called x because they're never going to get into conflict because your things are private to you and my things are private to me. And that's the way it works. That's the way it always works in C. And pass by value, the way that we pass arguments to a function, is universal. That is the only option we have in C. If I hand over something to f, I am never giving it my variable. I'm just giving it a value. And f can do whatever it wants with that value because it gets its own copy. 
But then there's a question of whether maybe sometimes, if I'm in main or if I'm in F, I want to give another function access to my private possessions. Not all of them, because obviously that might be a security risk. But maybe I do want to allow some other function or some other scope to have limited access to some of my private possessions if I explicitly allow it. And with pass by value, we don't get that. I pass something into f, f gets a copy. But I guess I could always let f return a value if I want to get some data back from f. Instead of giving f access to my own private possessions, I could just tell f, hey, return a value to me. That'll be the way I get data back from the function. And that's going to bring me to my second point in a minute, but let's finish the example. So I'm sitting at the end of uh, the function f, so I've just done this line, line number 15, and so the function now ends. It's a function with return type void, so there is no need for a return statement. I just get to line 16 and the function returns, and that means that the scope for the function is gone. And so we end up back at the point that we called our function f, which is on line number 23. We'll just clean that up a bit. And here we are back in the scope for main, and we generate one more line of output, main 2. And we say x equals, well, hey, yeah, x equals 6. Because this variable here was never modified by anything. And y equals 10. And just to clarify that last point, notice that there is nowhere in main, besides the initial assignment, where I write x equals or y equals. And I've mentioned before that one of the nice things we can, one of the nice properties of assignment in C is that the only time a variable will ever change is if that variable appears on the left-hand side of an assignment statement. So unless I write x equals somewhere in main, the value of x in main isn't going to change based on what we know now. Now we're going to have to add a couple of extra tools to our toolkit here, but that assurance still holds. The only time a variable can ever be modified is if that variable or something equivalent to that variable appears on the left-hand side of an assignment. Okay, so if I want a function to have data, I can provide it arguments. The arguments are passed by value. If I want to get data back from a function, well, of course, I could always have the function return me a value. That should do the trick. There shouldn't ever be a reason why I need to give a function access to my private possessions so that it can modify them, right? So that brings me to my second point. Now, this is a, a bit of a mock-up. Uh, think about this as sort of the opposite of that assignment 3 function called day index. So in the day index function, I give you a year, month, and day, so 2020, October 14th. And I want you to tell me the, the number of that day inside of the year. I actually don't know that off the top of my head, but 200 and something, I guess. Um, and so I give you three values, year, month, day. You give me back one. But what if I wanted to ask the reverse question? I give you a day index, and you give me back three things. Well, that should be an operation I'm allowed to do. I should be allowed to reverse any operation that I perform. So here's a mock-up based on that, a little bit of a simpler problem. I give you the number of minutes since midnight. So 187 minutes. So that would mean we assume that midnight would be, I don't know, on a 24-hour clock, we would call that 0000. So 60 minutes past midnight would be 1 a.m. And 120 minutes past midnight would be 2 a.m. And 180 minutes past midnight would be 3 a.m. And that means 187 past midnight would be uh, 3.07 a.m. Okay, so I give you the number of minutes past midnight, and I want you to give me the hour and minute, to split it up into two different things. And you can think about this if you wanted to go in reverse. If I gave you the hour and minute, Turning that into the number of minutes since midnight, you would just multiply the hour by 60 and add in the minute. So we can go in either direction here, but I specifically want to start with the number of minutes since midnight, and I want to figure out um, what the hour and minute is. So I've written a program that does that. It turns out that integer division is actually our friend here. If we divide the number of minutes by 60 with integer division, we get the hour. If we take the number of minutes modulo 60, we get the minute. Now that's trivia for the sake of this example. The point is I'm going from one value, one number, to having two. The number of minutes since midnight to having the hour and minute. So let's try that. Okay, so we'll run this. And 
At 187 minutes after midnight, the time is 3.07. Okay, great. Now, I won't belabor this. Maybe you can believe that that works correctly. I will note that in the printf statement, um, I use this percent 02D, which does make the time show up nicely as 3.07, as opposed to just 3 colon 7, which looks weird. Uh, but what I want to do is, of course, I might want to use this code a lot. And if I want to use it over and over again, I don't just want to hard code it into main. I want to write a function. Okay, great. Well, that's that's easy, Bill. We learned functions. We learned functions like like four weeks ago. It feels like 10 years ago, but four weeks ago. No big deal, right? Okay, fair enough. Let's go write a function. Okay, so the function will be called time of day. And I give you the number of minutes since midnight. That is an integer. Okay, great. And then you return to me two different values hour and minute. Uh, okay, so time of day, and it takes the number of minutes uh, since midnight. Yep, good, okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm going for partial marks on this one. And then it's a function, so it needs a return type. What does it return, an int? Well, no, it has to return two different things. So what do I do? And the answer is I'm out of luck. In C, Every function must have a return type, and every function must return one value, unless it's a function of return type void, in which case it returns nothing. You can't write a function that returns separately two ints. That is not allowed. So what do we do here? Well, it turns out there are a couple of ways around this. First, we could have it return one number, but that really wouldn't help us. We can't get both the hour and minute if they're in the same number. This function would do nothing. We've already contained them in the same number by referring to the number of minutes since midnight. So what do we do? We'll see later in the course there is another option for packaging up two different values into one big container and then returning that. So there actually is another option here. The key is we've reached the point where we need to learn something new. What we know so far about functions doesn't do the trick. I need the ability to return two different values. And we also want to think about the fact that um, this pass by value business has another disadvantage. It's one that's only on the horizon for us. We don't yet know enough to see this disadvantage in practice. But the disadvantage is that if I want to provide f with one of my variables, the value of one of my variables, like the value 6, I have to make a photocopy. What f ends up receiving is a photocopy of the number 6. And f can destroy that or mangle it however it wants, because f never actually gets access to the personal property of main. So here's main, and it's got a variable called x. And if I want to provide the value of x to f, I have to make a photocopy. No big deal. It's one number. But what if in my function main I had a variable that contained a horrendous amount of strange opaque data? So not just one number, but 10,000 numbers or 4 million numbers. If I want to make a photocopy of that, that's going to take a while. And that's a reason why maybe instead of making a copy, I might want to give f access to my original. And so what we need is a second option. It's good to make photocopies because that means if f destroys its photocopy, it doesn't harm the original. But there are times where making a photocopy can be expensive. There are also times when we need to, to allow a function to modify our own stuff because we need to use that as a way for the function to give us back information. So here I've got this variable z of some unknown type. We haven't yet seen types that it contain a huge amount of data. What I want is instead of giving f a photocopy of everything, I want to give f directions that tell it how to find my data. So I want to allow f explicitly to access my private possessions. I want to allow f the ability to break the normal rules of scope in a controlled sense. By instead of giving f a value, I give f directions to my original. And if f then follows those directions, it can use my data without making a photocopy. Okay, great. So if I had such a feature, what would I call it? Oh, it's like Okay, so um, I'll call this variable p because it, it points to this original thing and I have to give it a type, an, an arrow. I don't, actually, I got a good name for it. Let's call that a pointer. 